ten people in the audience. <laughs> a long time ago, I don't remember when it was. I think, is this the mic that's working? Whatever that is. <laughs> anyway. Uh, boy, it really is humbling to be here, I'll tell you. I had dinner with people tonight who were 50 years younger than me. <laughs> they're, they're like freshmen in college. You all know where you are. And, it, uh, you know, you think that uh, dating an old woman 3.2 million years old would give you some perspective on time. <laughs> Try sitting with 18-year-olds. Um, you know, I had a fabulous dinner. <coughs> the food was actually pretty good, too. But we had uh, very interesting discussions about what they want to do. And, you know, you sit there as a, almost a fossil yourself. Um, it's interesting because we... Uh, Eighth graders or seventh graders always study. They have a unit on human origins, and I get these uh, emails all the time asking, you know, my name is Amy and I'm from some place, and we don't want to know the answer to these questions, and I'll get extra credit if you, you know, answer one of them. And uh, not long ago, we had one that was addressed to, to the Institute uh, of Human Origins General Mail, and it said, if Dr. Johansson is still alive. <laughs> You know, they all think that anybody famous has to be dead. <laughs> but um, it, it was a great, great uh, dinner together, and uh, it's always uh, exciting for me to be able to come out and talk to people about what uh, my passion has been ever since I was a young teenage boy. I always say that uh, if, if I were not me, I'd probably envy myself, because uh, I'm doing, as an adult, uh, what I always wanted to do as a teenager. And uh, when you think of the path through life, I always say to people, take out a pad of paper. I didn't say this to the, the uh, folks at dinner, but take a pad of paper and just for the fun of it, write down what you think is going to happen in your life. Mm -hmm. And it's just extraordinary because seldom does it even remotely resemble what it is you're interested in or what you wanted to do. But I have uh, had the extraordinary experience as a, uh, a scholar in uh, satisfying my childhood interest, which was in, uh, particularly in human origins. I became interested when I was a young teenager in the connections between uh, modern African apes and humans, and uh, the fact that there had to have been a common ancestor out there somewhere, and that there must have been various kinds of, uh, or evolutionary stages that we went through after the separation from that common ancestor. And it's what really ignited my imagination as a young boy growing up in Connecticut. And uh, to have had the opportunity to travel to Africa, and I, I hope there, who's, who's been to Africa? Was, well, you should go, you know, because if you listen to Spencer <laughs> Wells, a colleague of mine in National Geographic, we're all Africans, right? And we all carry African genes. We may not all have uh, the same color skin or the shape, same shape eyes or the same, same kind of hair, but we are all carrying in us African, drink, uh, African genes. And as you will see tonight, that ancestry we feel now goes back millions and millions and millions of years and is supported by an enormous amount of evidence from linguistics, from archaeology, from genetics, and from fossils and anthropology. So it's an extraordinary sort of evolutionary journey that we all share. And uh, I travel to Africa once or twice a year. And for those of you who have not been to Africa, it's an extraordinary experience to go home. So try to do that sometime. But as I said, I, I'm very rewarded by being able to do what I wanted to do as a young boy. Uh, went to school and studied anthropology and always believed that I would ultimately get to Africa. I had to believe, of course, that I would find something. I really didn't know if I would. But I did in 1974 when I was uh, on the faculty at Case Western Reserve University, which is a couple of hours and a half or so drive away. And then I migrated to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And much of my early formative career as a scientist and the major impact that I made on the field of paleoanthropology, the fellow sitting next to me on the flight today from Phoenix asked me what I did. I told him I was a paleoanthropologist, and he looked at me and he said, does that mean you study old anthropologists? <laughs> I said, no, I study human origins, but um, my early career as a paleoanthropologist was in Ohio 
And uh, the laboratory that I built at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History appropriately now is under the direction of an Ethiopian scholar. Uh, and Ethiopians, we've educated a number of Ethiopians, not this one in particular. But it's very rewarding now that there are a cadre of young Ethiopian scholars who are also sharing this interest in human origins and where we've come from. And the evolutionary record in Ethiopia <coughs> is extraordinary. It goes back close to six million years, right on up to the emergence of anatomically and behaviorally modern humans. But uh, my career took me to Ethiopia for the very first time in 1970, which is a long time ago, uh, when I had an opportunity to work in southern Ethiopia with a, a scholar who passed away a few years ago, Clark Howell, who was one of the real giants in the field of human origin studies, who took me there as one of his assistants and it didn't take long for me to realize that this was really what I wanted to do to spend time in the field and search for these fragments that enlighten us about our origins, where we've come from, and most importantly, as I said at dinner, where we fit into the natural world. The book that launched my interest was entitled A Man's Place in Nature, and I think that this has been an overriding theme in the work that I've done in Africa. It is most important for us to understand that we are not, as I was taught as an undergraduate anthropology major, super organic. We are not separate from the biological world. We are a product of the biological world. We have come here through the same process that all other life has, and we just happen to be the most intelligent, the most destructive uh, species <coughs> on the planet, and we have acquired, as our, our late uh, colleague Stephen Jay Gould said, an awesome responsibility. We didn't ask for it, but as frightening as it sounds, we are the guardians of the future of this planet. And it is time for the species to take that, that responsibility <coughs> seriously. So, I don't know, can we turn on any lights or so people can get a better view of the present? Oh, that's great. They can always see me up here, right? Oh, no, they, now they can't. That went off. <coughs> Why did that go off? No, just coming back up. Anyway. Uh, you've been staring, of course, at a satellite picture of uh, Africa, which is uh, really the crucible for human evolution. We know that all the important developments that have made us human occurred first in Africa and migrated out of Africa to other places around the globe. Uh, you learn probably a great deal about this in terms of using genetics to trace migrations from uh, Spencer Wells, uh, who's a wonderful uh, researcher and a great lecturer and a good friend of mine at National Geographic Society. Tonight we're going to delve into the fossil evidence for human evolution and why Africa has played or how Africa has played such an important role in the emergence of uh, humans. Uh, Charles Darwin, of course, in 1859 published uh, a wonderful book called The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Uh, this really presented for the very first time, there were others who had dabbled in the idea of change over time, but this was really the codification of the idea that uh, there was descent with modification, uh, that all life came from a common ancestry, and that the important mechanism what is what he called natural selection, which is something that happens every day to life all over this planet. Um, this was an extraordinary event, as you can well imagine. Uh, the most, what I'm most envious about is that what was published on November 24th, 1859, and his book sold out in one day. Would you love to be an author of a book that sold out in one day? But uh, it had an extraordinary influence on uh, everyone's perception of what life was about, and particularly who we were as a species. As some people have said, we are just another species along the way. And yet, and it upset a lot of people, of course, particularly in Victorian England, uh, to think that we had evolved from some primitive ape, that we were not created as an individual that we look at today, in the form that we are today. And it upset so many people in terms of the religious beliefs, but Darwin's idea, long before we knew anything about genes, long before we knew how individual traits were inherited and so on, came up with what is called the grand unifying theory of biology. Dobzhansky said, um, nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. So this was 
truly what Thomas Kuhn would have said, a major paradigm shift. We use the word paradigm inappropriately all the time. But this was a major shift in thinking about how humans came to be who they are today. And Darwin was aware of the influence and effect that saying this would have in Victorian England. And he said very, very little in his book about human evolution. Here you see, he wrote, light will be thrown on the origin of man. His, and his history. And that's all he said, but that was enough. And you, you don't get to that until virtually the last page of the Origin of Species. Um, ultimately, however, uh, he expanded his thought on this, and in a typical English understatement, he says, much light will be thrown <laughs> in the final edition of his Origin of Species. But uh, let's not sell Darwin short, because Darwin in 1871 published a book uh, called The Descent of Man in which he really addressed how applying the principles of evolutionary change and particularly adaptation and especially natural selection could explain the emergence of modern humans. He was influenced very much by a close colleague and friend, Thomas Henry Huxley, who wrote Man's Place in Nature, that book I read when I was about 13 years old, and developed this interest in human evolution. And Huxley and Darwin looked at skeletons as well as some zoo specimens, but looked at skeletons and saw that the basic bauplan, the basic skeletal plan of all the apes, including us, we're sometimes called the upright ape or the naked ape or whatever, uh, are all very similar. And because of the numerous similarities shared by this group of primates, orangs, gibbons, chimps, and gorillas, and humans, we must have shared a common ancestor. And this is long before there was a fossil record anywhere, and their detailed investigations of teeth and bones, the things that I read about in Huxley's uh, book, uh, Man's Place in Nature, uh, showed the closest similarities with the African apes, the chimpanzee and the gorilla. And they therefore decided that if we were going to find ancient or more primitive looking versions of humans, that would be found in Africa and not in Asia. <laughs> And they made that prognostication in the late 1870s. Uh, they know that uh, we have a great number of similarities in the hard anatomy as well as the soft anatomy, meaning muscles and so on. We know that uh, we share a great number of similarities in behavior. Uh, the work of Jane Goodall, who is uh, 77 this year, and has the longest lasting uh, field study of any primate in the world showed us that not only do we really look like the African apes, in particular the chimpanzees, but there are many things that are similar in terms of our behavior. They share astonishment and surprise and passion and sadness and wonder. This chimp up here on the right, he's not trying to catch those uh, termites that are flying, he's just got his hand up in the air as if this is a moment of great astonishment for him that they do make rudimentary tools. Here you see termite stick being used here, and this, her, the, the mother and the daughter looking on, watching the mother wet this piece of straw, stick it into the termite mound, pull it out, and eat the insects off of that. So many of the rudiments of what we see today, highly developed in humans, we see in rudimentary stages in the chimpanzees. It doesn't mean that we evolved from chimpanzees. It means that some of those behaviors were probably present in the common ancestor to the African apes and ourselves. And of course now we know that we are some 99% identical to one another in terms of our genomes, which uh, bespeaks a common recent uh, ancestor. And um, so that there's no question anymore that these two species are very closely related to one another. I think you recognize someone in that expression. Um, one of the greatest misconceptions, I think, in, uh, in human evolutionary studies and in the, what we see in New Yorker cartoons all the time, uh, is the fact that uh, it is a march through time. That once this ancient primitive ancestor began to stand up, it would ultimately evolve into a white European male, which is almost the pinnacle of evolution. And my students asked me why, and I said, because white European males draw these things. That's why. We all think we're the pinnacle of evolution. 
You never quite know that it's a male, as you can see, but uh, <laughs> find those important diagnostic uh, anatomical features. And the other thing that one sees in the middle of all of this, we're, we're afraid when we spill some water up here, we're afraid we're going to short circuit the computer. And not be good. Um, is that there's something inherent about this evolutionary uh, picture of the way it happened, that it was an inexorable march from ape to angel. We're always the angel, here are the apes. But uh, not only that, but yeah, there's something about becoming human that makes us really happy. You see how he's a little happier, a little happier. He's really happy to be Homo sapiens. Well, Dar Dar there is no such process as hominization, but we see so many different variations of this. Even Darwin knew, and this was the one illustration Darwin had in his book. It's why I think I spent more time with Huxley's book, because it had lots of interesting pictures in it. Darwin had this one illustration of hypothetical family tree of life, showing, interestingly, more extinctions than survivals, and knowing that most life on this planet that's ever existed is going extinct. Some 98, 99% of all species that have ever existed on this planet have gone extinct. Yet we, Homo egocentricus, think that our species is never going to go extinct. Anyway, uh, time does have a lesson to uh, teach us. But um, Darwin knew very well that it was not a straight lineage, a straight march through time, that the tree of life really was a tree of life, that there were many branches, most of which didn't make it to present day, but that it was the, uh, the evolution of diversity that was important. And what's interesting about this diagram is a colleague of mine published in Science a few years ago his view of what the human family tree looked like and how astonishingly similar uh, are these two diagrams, even though this was long before we had any idea of what the human family tree looked like. Well, Darwin and Huxley, uh, in their prognostications, uh, really hit the nail on the head. They assumed that since we were most similar to the African apes, Africa is where our earliest ancestors lived. But they died long before any evidence was discovered uh, in Africa that would uh, confirm uh, that particular notion. Uh, there are many places in Africa, like Southern Africa and places in Eastern Africa. I was in Tanzania last month uh, at Old Dubai Gorge, and everybody there talks about that being the cradle of humankind. You go to Ethiopia, people talk about the Afar region being the cradle of humankind. Uh, it's really Africa that was the crucible that molded uh, our ancestors to become who we are today. The first discovery was made in the late 1920s by this cheerful looking guy. This is uh, Professor Raymond Dart, the late Professor Raymond Dart. See, they all are dead. <laughs> but uh, he was, uh, he recognized this specimen known as the Tong Baby uh, that was found in 1924 and published in February of 1925 in the journal Nature uh, as a creature that was somewhere in between ape and human. He called it a missing link. We don't like to use that name, but he called it a missing link. He said it had a very small brain. It is a child. It was a baby. This is the first permanent molar just here erupting. Our first permanent molar has erupted about age six, but this was probably around uh, three or four years old when this individual died. It was a child, so it would have features that were more like an adult modern human than the adult version of this species. But he suggested from the hole at the bottom of the skull where the spinal cord comes out that it was walking upright. And that was one of the cardinal features of what it means to be placed on the human family tree rather than the ape family tree. And even as an adult, it would have had a very small brain, so it was very ape-like in that regard. But this confirmed in so many ways the presence of earlier, much more ape-like creatures in Africa. He gave it a tongue twister name, Australopithecus. Australo is from the Latin, of course, meaning southern, like Australia. Pithecus is from the Greek meaning uh, ape, the southern ape, which is a bit of a misnomer. It's not really the best name because it's not an ape, and the southern ape of Africa. <coughs> and Australopithecus is a name that we will hear a lot about uh, this evening. And between 1925 and uh, the late 1950s, South Africa pretty much dominated our understanding 
of, earliest, of the earliest human stages of uh, our evolution. Uh, because of cave sites in southern Africa, and I will talk about Australopithecus sediba, which was announced just recently in National Geographic and in Science Magazine, stunning discoveries from southern Africa that I'll talk about a little bit later. But these were subterranean caves, not where they lived, but where they fell in and became fossilized. And that pretty much colored our view of what human evolution was like in Africa until the late 1950s when the late uh, Lewis and Mary Leakey, uh, pictured here uh, at Old Vi Gorge, began to make significant discoveries on the edge of the Serengeti Plain, just here, um, of fossils that were about 1.8 million years old. We didn't know how old the Tong baby was at that time. We knew it was ancient. It probably is about two and a half million years in age, although there's not a, a, a firm date on the age of the Tong baby. But they began to find fossils here, like this uh, specimen called Nutcracker Man, or Zinjanthropus. Zinj, you know, an Arabic word for East Africa, and Anthropus from the, uh, from the Greek meaning man. Um, or uh, Nutcracker Man, or Zinjanthropus, Olduvai Hominid 5, that was found at Olduvai in 1959. I was now 16 years old. I was in high school. Uh, a neighbor saved the newspaper clipping for me. And that's when I, you know, I just, this is what I want to do, absolutely. It was, it was an exciting moment for me as a young boy to see the announcement of Sinjanthropus. And this was particularly fortuitous because it drew attention to one of the great geological structures on the planet. One that you can easily see from outer space, and that is the great Africa's Great Rift Valley that runs uh, all the way from Mozambique in the south right on up to the Red Sea and into the Middle East. And this is a, a stunningly beautiful place. This is a photograph of northern Kenya. Uh, you see uh, the rift system here. You see old vol extinct volcanoes in the background. Uh, this is the edge of the rift valley right here. This has been developing for the last 15 to 20 million years and is a place where animals and artifacts and uh, sediments were deposited in lakes and rivers and preserved for millions of years and are now reappearing on the surface because of erosion. And it was the single discovery at Old Divide that ignited a whole series of expeditions still ongoing to this geological structure of the Great Rift Valley. Uh, in the introduction, you heard about the Alfar Triangle. That's this area up here, the largest expanse of the Great Rift Valley because the Horn of Africa, that is to say Somalia and Ethiopia, are slowly moving away from the core of Africa. The core of Africa has been very stable for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. But because of this liniment of instability here and tectonic movements and continental drift, that Horn of Africa is slowly moving away, rifting uh, that part of Africa and re-exposing these ancient sediments. <coughs> So the two major places where the majority of early human ancestors have been found are here in southern Africa, here in eastern Africa, and there are a few specimens from north central Africa from a country known as Chad. But it's only because of the, of the right <coughs> geological phenomena that these fossils are preserved and found in places like this. I suspect that Australopithecus lived all over Africa, but here in West Africa, it was very heavily forested, the soils were very acidic, and the bones just were not preserved. So the only windows we have into the past are Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. And this is where I first began my research down here in Southern Africa, or Southern Ethiopia as a graduate student at the University of Chicago. Here you see the, uh, this is Kenya, just down here, this is Lake Turkana, <coughs> just peeking up, and this is the Omo River that starts up around Addis Ababa, up in the highlands, and forms uh, the major source of water for this huge lake in northern Kenya. And it was on the western side, just about here, where I began to work in 1970 with my professor from the University of Chicago. And then in, the, uh, in 1972, I was invited by a geologist to come up and begin exploration in this large triangular area known as the Afar Triangle. An interesting place for geologists <laughs>
because the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the Great Rift Valley all intersect in one place. So it's called the Triple Junction, and much of the uh, interest in continental drift and so on can be studied in this particular area. And it's a very rich area, very rich in fossils. And uh, we began working there, as I said, in 1972. And the place that I chose to work is known as Hadar, just here. This is the Awash River. There's a divide here between the north and the south. Here's the Omo River. Here is the Blue Nile going off here. And uh, the Awash River, which never makes it to the coast. It ends in a uh, landlocked lake, as you can see. But it's just above the bend in this river. Uh, where I decided to concentrate my work. We visited this site in April, May of 1972, and I'll never forget standing on the edge of the escarpment, the edge of the plateau, and looking down into these deposits. To a paleoanthropologist, this is a delicious-looking picture. <laughs> these are ancient uh, sediments of clay, silts, and sandstones that were deposited in large lakes, in deltas and rivers and so on. And when we drove down into these deposits the next morning, I found that it was littered with bones everywhere. And the right kinds of bones of the right age. I knew from the stage of evolution of many of these uh, fossils, sometimes fossils can be very diagnostic of time, for example. The example I used at dinner was if we went out and someone found a piece of dinosaur, in a rock, you would know that rock was older than 65 million years old because dinosaurs died, died out 65 million years ago. So I knew this site was somewhere between 3 and 4 million years in age. I also knew from all of my uh, graduate work that human fossils older than 3 million years, the entire collection that was known at that time, you could fit into the palm of your hand. It was a piece of jaw, a piece of skull, and a piece of arm bone and a single tooth, and that was essentially it. We didn't know what pre-Tong or pre zinjanthropus creatures looked like. And uh, I felt that if we could find ancient fossils from this series of sediments, we would be opening up a rather significant new perspective on human origins. Uh, the team still goes to the field every two years. Um, we're not going this year, we'll probably not go back until 2013, but we set up a camp like this. This is my camp set up right along the Awash River, which is a source of uh, <laughs> permanent water for us. Critical when you've got 30 or 40 people out here that you have a, a constant source of a drinkable water. And uh, you live out there in these various tents for two to three months, searching for fossils, doing geology, excavating artifacts, and so on. It's a very remote part of Africa, still not very well understood and known. I'm going uh, back to this area in January with a group of uh, uh, friends and um, people who have served on my board of directors to take them to Hadar, but it's still a, a wild place. And one needs guards when we go there. These are the Afar tribesmen uh, with whom I've worked over these many years. They've not only um, they're not only very good fossil finders, this is where they grew up, this is, they know this land like nobody, uh, but they've also become very involved in the research, uh, not to the point where they're, you know, doing scientific research, but they are certainly very proud of the fact that their region is yielding some of the oldest fossils for human ancestry from anywhere in the world. Uh, the sort of work I'm talking about is transdisciplinary, it's multidisciplinary, uh, we have a large team of geologists, people who do stratigraphy and do the mapping. We have geologists who actually date the ages of these rock horizons, mostly through argon dating. Uh, we have geomorphologists uh, uh, who begin to try to understand uh, the, uh, the whole time sequence of this area and, geo and, and, and the shape of the landscape. There are biologists, people who study the ancient uh, pigs and rhinos and monkeys and elephants, plant <laughs> remains, even fo fossilized pollen remains, to help reconstruct what the environment was like, and anthropologists like myself who, of course, go out looking for hominid remains of, of individuals that had lived there millions of years ago. So it's an extraordinary amalgam of scientists and students who come together to dedicate part of their lives to understand the very earliest stages of the human career. 
At dinner, I was asked, how do you know where to look? Well, <coughs> how do you know where to look? I mean, there's no sign that says dig here, or Lucy was here. I mean, you could find an important fossil anywhere in that landscape. And the only way one can do that is to get out onto the landscape as you see these individuals just walking and looking, looking and walking day in and day out. Now here is a uh, fairly complete elephant foot, about 3.4 million years that I've kind of reassembled a little bit, but uh, it could just as well have been remains of one of our human ancestors. But the only way to find these things is dedicated foot survey that is often come, it often you come up empty handed. Sometimes you can survey for an entire field season and not find anything significant. So it takes a great deal of uh, time and effort and dedication to find these sorts of things. The one thing that attracted me uh, to the site of Hadar and to this particular region called the Afar region was the remarkable completeness of the fossils. I have been working in southern Ethiopia where most of the geological deposits were river deposits. So when an animal dies or gets swept in by a rainstorm to a river, it decays and begins to break apart and begins to scatter and fragment and get broken. But here at Hadar, most of these sediments were calm water. So an animal might come down to the lake and die there or be washed into the lake floated out into the lake, begun to decay, still with the ligaments holding the bones together, would fall to the bottom and be covered in clays and sands and silts so that the fossils are much more complete. Here you see an uh, elephant cranium uh, with the tusks beautifully preserved. We had most of the elephant preserved. This is at a lake margin covered by a sand uh, covering this animal that lived something like 3.4 million years ago. And it was with this remarkable completeness that I fantasized about finding much more complete remains of human ancestors. The animals' uh, fossils are also, as I said, very important for reconstructing environment. It was not a desert uh, when Lucy lived here 3.2 million years ago. It was uh, much more forested, much greener, much wetter. It was a mosaic set of environments so that you had denser uh, forests like this, but also open areas and fo uh, woodland areas. It was a diversity in environments that these early humans were living in. And everything in the paleontology, the different kinds of animals, as well as fossil pollen, and some of the inferences about rainfall, uh, paint this kind of picture of that ancient world. Well, it was here uh, in 1974. I was, uh, it was the fall of 1974, November 24th. 1974, when I was uh, teaching uh, at Western Reserve University, I had the fall off because I had a National Science Foundation grant and went off to uh, Ethiopia with the hope of finding something. That was also the year I finished my PhD at the University of Chicago. I uh, defended my thesis, a stunning, very gripping thesis on chimpanzee teeth. <laughs> <laughs> all want a copy of. But uh, I had done a, a a thesis on chimpanzee teeth. I defended my thesis and I got my sort of union card, which is a PhD. And I remember I had one particularly prickly member of my PhD committee. There's always one who just loves to grill you to death. And uh, after I successfully defended, he was very official and he would say, he said, well, what are you going to do to have it done? And I said, well, I'm going to Africa to find something. And uh, in October of that year, I found Lucy. So I sent him a little postcard back to the field and said, I found something. <laughs> so this is the fine spot. This is the place where uh, it happened around noon on November 24th, 1974, when I was out with a former graduate student of mine, Tom Gray. We were doing you know, that boring mapping and so on and so forth. And we had surveyed in this area and found very little. Uh, there were some fragments of a baboon skull and a piece of antelope lower jaw and a few other things. And we were taking the easy way back and walking in this drainage, back to climb over this little ridge and go down and get our Land Rovers and go back to camp. And just about where you see folks working here, I happened to look over my right shoulder, uh, a well-known story, and I saw this little piece of arm bone, 
an arm bone that comes from your elbow. It actually is what we call our elbow, that thing that sticks out. And the bone that allows us to flex and extend at the elbow. And I knew instantly, because of the, its anatomy, because of the shape of the bone, that this was not a monkey bone, this was not an antelope bone. The only thing it could possibly be, even though it was very tiny, was from a hominid, uh, an ancient hominid. And when I kneeled down, I saw other pieces uh, on the surface. I saw a piece of skull, I saw a piece of pelvis, I saw a piece of jaw, and I said things that I can't repeat in public. But it was a moment of great astonishment for me. I was overwhelmed. And I, there I was, looking at you know a childhood dream down at my feet. And we spent two and a half weeks at the site collecting, using lots of toilet paper, uh, to wrap the bones up. Here's Tom Gray. Uh, here's a much skinnier, Don Johansson, much younger. And this was, this was the bone right here. This little fragment of bone that looks like a little wrench uh, that is the bone. That is the elbow right there, what you call your elbow, the thing that sticks out. And that led to a whole series marked by these blue and orange markers, fragments of about a 40% complete skeleton. And that skeleton had been preserved in this ridge just here in sandstone. The rock below it is uh, composed of clay and silt. That was eroding away. That capping of sandstone was a harder, more compressed uh, layer of rock that was resistant. And uh, she had eroded out. We don't know when. We don't know when the first fragments came out. We only have parts of the skull, so probably the skull was one of the things that eroded out first, rolled down the hill, broke up, and was washed away. And if I had looked to my left instead of my right, I might have missed the specimen, might have missed the skeleton. And if there had been a major rainstorm between field seasons, the skeleton might have been washed away down over a cliff and we never would have found her. Strange serendipity involved here. In fact, when we went to this site, we went to map it because of a beautiful complete pig skull that had been found there a year before by one of the expedition members and it left a marker. And when I looked around, I could see within feet of where I found that first bone, the footsteps that were footprints that were left by that researcher the year before, who had walked right by the skeleton. Um, here again, you see a much younger guy with sideburns and <laughs> disciple of the 60s. Um, I, was, I was filmed yesterday in my lab in, in, uh, in Arizona for the History Channel on, um, they're doing a program on the 100 most exciting discoveries or something or other. And Lucy is one of them. And I asked what some of the other ones were. And, uh, one of them is, uh, I think, uh, what did he say? Oh, oh, well, I can't remember all he said, but he did mention Jimi Hendrix's guitar. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I went to Woodstock. And he was astonished. He couldn't believe it. Because kid of the 60s. And uh, heard Jimi Hendrix when he played there. But at any rate, long sidebirds were in in those days. But here is the French geologist Maurice Taieb, who organized uh, this international expedition. And it is uh, the first time we're beginning to assemble uh, the bones of Lucy. Uh, they are still covered to a large extent in sandstone. We really didn't know what we had. We knew it was older than three million years. We knew there were parts of upper and lower limbs. It was part of a pelvis. There were parts of the backbone. There was a complete lower jaw. We knew that uh, it was something important. I suspected it was Australopithecus, but I didn't know if it was an Australopithecus africanus like Raymond Dart or something new. And as you heard in the introduction, it was ultimately named after the Afar region as Australopithecus afarensis, the Afar southern ape is what that translates. And uh, she has really become iconic uh, in terms of paleoanthropology. She is probably the, if not one of the, best known fossil discoveries of the 20th century. And she really represents an individual. When you look at her, you get a sense that this was a living person, as opposed to when you look at, say, a fragment of jaw or a, a leg bone. When you put it together like this, you see an image, you see a person. And uh, she played an incredibly important role in paleoanthropology and continues to do so. And is really the touchstone or the benchmark by which so many other discoveries are judged. 
uh, my colleague Tim White at uh, University of California at Berkeley, who announced Artipithecus rhamnitus, that we'll talk about shortly. I know the first thing they did when they found fragments of that skeleton brought them back to Addis Ababa, where Lucy lives in a safe, and compared their finds with Lucy. So she is a very important benchmark by which other discoveries uh, are judged. Also, she has become very much a part of our vernacular, mainly because she got a lovely little name. And people ask tonight, you know, how did, no, they didn't ask tonight, but somebody asked me the other day, how did she get her name? Most of you know, but uh, I had a, we were celebrating in camp uh, that night, uh, the night of discovery. It was a great night to celebrate in the desert. And I had a girlfriend on the expedition, whose name was Pamela. But, uh, <laughs> And we were listening to uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club band, Heart and Lonely Hearts Club band, uh, and a great Beatles fan. And Lucy and this guy with diamonds was playing. And Pamela said, "Well, if you think it's, if you really think it's a female skeleton," and I did because the bones are very small, which I'll get to in a minute. And she said, "Why don't you call her Lucy?" And I thought, you know, I've just struggled through a 400-page thesis on chimpanzee teeth, and I have a PhD from the University of Chicago, and are we going to give our fossils cute little names or give them Australopithecus names? Uh, but it was too late. Once that name was uttered by a Pam, uh, by breakfast everybody was talking about, uh, you think you'll find more of Lucy's skull? How tall do you think Lucy was? How old was she when she died? And so on. So that's the name that uh, stuck. Uh, what's interesting is the length of her uh, femur or thigh bone is only the length of a ruler. It's 12 inches long, 280 millimeters. Uh, reach down and see how long your thigh bone is. So obviously she had to be very short. And the question was, well, was she perhaps a child? Was this not an adult? But looking at the complete dentition, the wisdom teeth, their third molars, are erupted which is a sign that biologically she has stopped growing. And the growth plates that you would normally find at the ends of the long bones have been closed and fused, so there's no growth taking place. So this was an adult female, probably died around age 10 years, something like that, and uh, yet was very short. Uh, the other thing that we noticed immediately was the fact that she had relatively long arms. Uh, probably a hangover from her ancestry when her ancestors were living almost exclusively in trees. So you had about 40% of a single of specimen that opened up a vast arena of research. We had colleagues, particularly Owen Lovejoy at Kent State, uh, who spent a great deal of time with her locomotor system, looking at the pelvis, the knee, and the ankle, and assessing the fact that this was clearly an upright bipedal creature, yet it had a very small brain. We don't have much of the skull preserved, but we were able to tell from the curvature of the back of the skull that this didn't have a brain much bigger than a softball, for example. So it was a major discovery that opened up a vast new area of research for us. What was interesting about it was you had a pelvis, and this is uh, Owen Lovejoy's reconstructed pelvis of uh, Lucy. We had the left half of the pelvis, what we call the hip bone, or the anominate, that's where the femur fits in right there. We had the sacrum, or it's mis, mis, sometimes you call it the tailbone. And because our bodies are more or less symmetrical from side to side, we took the left side mirror image the right side and came up with a complete pelvis. And this is a pelvis that is very similar to this pelvis and very different from a chimpanzee pelvis. So this is what a pelvis of your dog or chimp or horse or cat looks like. These are creatures that locomote on all fours. These are quadrupeds. This is what you're sitting on right now, your <laughs> pelvis, and every one of us in this room is a bipedal walker. We walk on two legs. It's a unique, bizarre, strange mode of locomotion, but it certainly was very successful with nearly 7 billion people on this planet and uh, distinguishes us from all other primates, all other mammals. And here you see Lucy's pelvis, but she still retained the indelible stamp of an ape-like ancestry in the skull or cranium. We had a very small brain case and a relatively large face, whereas today we have very small faces and very large brain case. 
So she still had a very ape-like cast to her <coughs> face and skull, yet she was fully capable of walking upright. So she was reconstructed in the pages of uh, National Geographic. Uh, as you see here, this is a reconstruction that Lovejoy did of the entire skeleton and photographed by David Brill, a uh, photographer I've worked with for a number of years, showing, uh, I think very clearly, how long and gangly her arms really were. So obviously, in terms of the sequence of events, the first major changes for bipedal adaptation, the walking upright, were changes in the foot, the knee, and the hip. And only later did uh, the arms, uh, they didn't really shorten. What happened was the lower limbs lengthened. Our lower limbs are much longer than our upper limbs because this is the major propulsive lever arm for bipedal locomotion. But here was something that we captured a, 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 a snapshot of that still had that ape-like ancestry in its upper limbs. Lucy has become one of the most celebrated discoveries at the National Museum in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. She's a national treasure in Ethiopia. She has a wonderful Ethiopian name, which is called, where she is called Dinkinesh, which means you are wonderful. And uh, in 1985, the Ethiopian government uh, minted this remarkable stamp to celebrate her discovery. In Ethiopia, she's often known by her Anglican name, Lucy, rather than Dinkinesh. There are universities, like there are colleges, like the Lucy College. There are Lucy fruit stands. There's a Lucy political magazine. There's a Lucy bakery. There's a Lucy soccer cup. And uh, the Ethiopians are very proud that the earliest humans came from there. But uh, one of the most remarkable things a graduate student brought me recently was this Tazo Redbush tea, which, uh, as you know, is a, uh, from South Africa. And uh, I thought, well, so what? He said, read the back. And it reads, some say all human beings descended from a single African primate named Lucy. If it's true, she probably enjoyed taking a break from the kids. It's red, Tazo Redbush tea. So she is part of our vernacular, you see her on Jeopardy, you see her name in crossword puzzles and so on. And uh, the sequence at Hadar ranges from about 3.4 million years, just here where there's a volcanic ash dated, right on up to about 2.9, then there's a gap, a uh, period of erosion or non-deposition. Uh, and then fossils begin to be found at about 2.4 million years. The bulk of the fossils uh, belong to Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy's species. We now have uh, 400 plus specimens of her species over uh, roughly 200,000 years of time, which is quite remarkable, uh, which gives us a tremendous insight into the range of variation in the fossils of this particular species. This is the horizon where Lucy was found, and there is a volcanic date of about 3,200,000 years. And those are very precise dates. They're accurate, let's say, this, the actual date is 3,180,000 years, plus or minus 10,000 years. So that's pretty accurate uh, geophysical dating. And as I said, <clears throat> we have many, many specimens of her species. She's known from Tanzania, from the fossil footprints that were found uh, near Old Divide Gorge. She's known from uh, fragments in Kenya. She's known from one specimen in Chad and hundreds and hundreds of specimens in Ethiopia. And we now have complete female skull and a male skull of her species. Males were significantly larger than females, a condition known as sexual dimorphism, where males uh, were up to five feet in stature uh, and significantly different in size. We've assembled uh, fragments of virtually every part of the skeleton often in multiples when it comes to jaws and teeth. So we have a pretty good picture of what Lucy species Australopithecus afarensis looks like and a pretty good idea of the environment in which they lived 3.2 million years ago. Well, as Pliny the Elder wrote, as you all remember, I'm sure, <laughs> ex Africa sempre aliquid nome, always something new out of Africa. And uh, the most astonishing and tantalizing and probably controversial discovery over the past uh, 10 years or so is the announcement of uh, Ardipithecus ramidus, 
a, a series of fossils that are 4.4 million years in age. These take the story of human origins back uh, 1.2 million years older than the fossil specimens from uh, Hadar itself, uh, Lucy in particular. Uh, Tim White, uh, who is a professor at the uh, University of California at Berkeley, uh, made these discoveries, his team made these discoveries just here, where this yellow star is at a place called Aramis. Uh, here is where Hadar is, a star always moves when I show this. It should be right up, and that's Hadar right up there, the north of this river. Uh, so they're not very far apart, uh, but there is deeper dissection here, more ancient deposits. And what they found were these very fragmentary, very friable, very difficult specimens to uh, recover from the ground. They found them in the early 1990s, but they were just announced two years ago, and they were placed in a new genus, Artipithecus, uh, and in a new species, Ramidus, known as Arti for short. And uh, some of the remarkable work that Tim and his team accomplished was this is what the skull looked like. It was squished completely flat, and they scanned it, they put it in virtual space, and they reconstructed uh, the cranium and, the, and put the mandible on it uh, in a, a computer setting. It is very much, very ape-like, as you can see, in fact, very chimpanzee-like, both in its three-quarter view and its lateral view. They also were able to reconstruct, uh, and Lovejoy uh, led the charge on this, uh, the pelvis of Artipithecus. It is, as you can see, quite tall and narrow like a chimpanzee, but Lovejoy believes that there are certain features that suggest that at least part of the time it might have been bipedal and upright walking. So uh, this is a, an extraordinary discovery uh, because of its antiquity. It's a highly controversial specimen. Uh, here is a complete reconstruction of the skeleton on the left. And the one thing that you'll all notice immediately is a significantly divergent great toe. When you take your shower tonight or tomorrow morning, look down at your feet. If you have a toe like that, call me. <laughs> this is a grasping foot. This is a foot that would help you climbing. This is not the kind of foot that would be very good for walking bipedally on the ground. Yet they consider this a hominid, they consider it a transitional species, that gave rise to things like operensis. It's a female, weighed 50 kilos. 50 times 2.2 is about 111 pounds, 110 pounds. That's a pretty large individual. Lucy weighed something like 60 pounds. So this is a huge individual, if it is indeed a female. It had massive hands, as you can see, with long grasping digits. And uh, as I said, Tim and his group have suggested that when it came to the ground, it was, in fact, upright walking as they've reconstructed here. And in every reconstruction of Artie, you see it walking upright. So I uh, decided that it might be interesting to reconstruct Artie as a quadrupedal climber in the trees. And there are uh, numerous uh, scientists who, who suggest that perhaps Artie was on the hominid tree, that it was because, particularly because of canine reduction, and the lack of shearing between the upper canine and the lower premolar, a hominid as defined that way, but it was probably an extinct side branch. And this is where we're going to see enormous controversy over the next few years. Was the bipedal aspect of Artie more like what we see in some chimpanzees that are walking upright on tops of branches like this? Is that possible? Does it resemble fossils that were as much as uh, back in the Miocene that were looked like they might have been bipedal, but they were clearly arboreal. What are we looking at? Were there different ways of being upright walking? Were there different experiments on the human family tree? Some that made it and others that went extinct. Uh, the other area of uh, interest these days is the origins of our own genus. We belong in the genus Homo, which is Latin for man or mankind. Okay, we are Homo sapiens, which translates supposedly as wise man. If you read the New York Times like I do, I'm quite sure that's the best name for us. <laughs> but we are supposed to be sapient man. And um, there are a number of distinctions. 
For example, here you see a chimpanzee upper jaw, which is long and narrow, uh, very much like Australopithecus, whereas we have more parabolic shaped jaws. And recently our expeditions in Ethiopia have found, uh, this is now revised to 2.4 million years, this upper jaw, which is the oldest anatomical evidence for our own genus at about 2.4 million years and first associated with stone tools. So that we are, are now beginning to fill in that gap between afarensis and our own genus, but only with a few fragmentary specimens. Uh, undoubtedly you've read about uh, Lee Berger's discoveries. He is a, an American scholar who lives and works in South Africa and has found several partial skeletons much more complete than this astonishingly complete, beautifully preserved, of a new species which is called Australopithecus sediba. And in his um, announcement this last uh, April, May, he suggested that this was the ancestor to all later homo. But you can see it's 1.9 million years, so it's 500,000 <coughs> years too young to be an ancestor to homo, because homo has already made its appearance in eastern Africa. Um, the other thing that is captured a great deal of attention in uh, paleoanthropology is uh, the importance of uh, stone tools. And the uh, last time I spoke here, uh, our oldest stone tools were about 1.8 or maybe 2 million years. There is now good evidence for stone tools in Ethiopia at 2.6 million years. And some of them are associated with bones that are broken and show cut marks. So humans were beginning to incorporate a very important food source, meat, bone marrow, and so on, as much as 2.6 million years ago, a remarkable event in the human career. And the emergence of Homo sapiens, anatomically modern humans, goes back about 200,000 years. So if you look at Africa as the cradle or the crucible of human evolution, you see a common ancestor somewhere, say, maybe eight to 10 million years ago, a common ancestor to humans and African apes. You see the first upright walkers that may go back as much as six million years. We didn't talk about those tonight. Again, first appearance is in Africa. The appearance of uh, the first stone tools, 2.6 million years ago, again in Africa, long before they appear anywhere else. And the emergence of bodies of modern proportions at about 1.8 million years. So no matter where you grasp a branch on the family tree, the roots all lead back to Africa. And uh, I'm not going to say much about genes because Spencer Wells talked a great deal about this, but the highest frequency of progenitor genes, of the most ancient genes in the human genome, are found in African populations, particularly the San, or as they are sometimes referred to as uh, inappropriately, I think, as Bushmen. Uh, so this is where the initial genes that gave rise to all Homo sapiens on the planet today were, were, first, were first appeared in Southern Africa. So you have uh, the geological evidence, or the uh, paleontological evidence, you have the genetic evidence, and uh, recently there has been an investigation by a scientist at, the university New at a university in New Zealand uh, looking at the frequency of phonemes in a language. And the highest frequency of, of phonemes is here in Africa. The lowest frequency is in China. So this is where language probably also originated. So we now have linguistic evidence that Africa was the original homeland for all humanity. And out of Africa, as Spencer Wells pointed out to you, migrated populations that ultimately came to populate the rest of the now, when I first began my work in 1970, these are the numbers of species which we knew about our human ancestry that went back perhaps up two and a half, three million years ago. And now we've added all of these species. So it's getting much more complicated. It is much more difficult to really agree on evolutionary pathways and on whose family tree is correct. There are scientists, as you can see here, all over the world, <laughs> trying to figure out how all of this fits together. And everybody has their own version of the family tree. This is my current preferred scheme. And what is interesting about, oops, sorry, a little nervous finger there. Uh, 
what is interesting about this, if we can get back to it, yeah, is that when we look at the family tree, at about three to four million years, we see a widespread occurrence of Lucy species Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, Tim and I published a paper in Science in 1981 in which we postulated that this was the last common ancestor to those that led to uh, uh, many extinct branches, but one that also led to modern Homo sapiens, but also to a whole group of extinct Australopithecines. So that Lucy's species occupies a very pivotal place on the human family tree. So for the moment, that is more or less how we are looking at the family tree. So the legacy that Lucy has left us is quite extraordinary. And that legacy is that we all have an African origin, whether we look at the paleontology, the uh, genetics, or the linguistics, or even in terms of the early glimpses of art that are now being traced back to as much as 150,000 years in Africa that only appeared about 40,000 years in Europe. Europe was not the finishing school. <laughs> Sapiens who came out of Africa about 40,000 years ago brought with them all of this innovation that ultimately led to this worldwide species, Homo sapiens. So if there is any legacy here, it is that we have an African legacy, that we have a common origin, that we have a common beginning. And I think it's about time we recognize that we all have this common ancestry, and if we do that, we ought to consider what our common destiny is. Thank you very much.